Yeah. Okay, so last week we got through uh, three and four. And a quick recap in chapter, chapter eight, three, verse three, we found out that the law, could what it could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, but God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So we see an action of what God did in our flesh. He condemned sin in the flesh. So how does that work out in us? See, it's those little things that we have to stop, take a verse, ponder it, and figure out what does it mean to condemn sin in the flesh then what does that mean in the context of the chapters we just read? So in chapter 6, 12, we found out if we don't yield our members, sin lies dormant. So if he condemned sin in the flesh, there's something that took place judicially from his point of view. But I think there's even something more materialistic, powerful in our flesh. That took place. But I can't tell you what that is because I really don't know. All I know is that chapter 6, by not yielding my members, sin stays dormant. And I don't arouse it. Therefore, according to chapter 8, I allow the Holy Spirit to dominate my flesh and to guide me. That's what chapter 8 is all about. And then he says in verse 4, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So this requirement of righteousness, spirit and walking in the spirit. Mm -hmm. So we're fulfilling the law, which we know about as we're walking in this, what we call righteousness or sanctification area. The righteous requirement of the, fl of the flesh would be death. Is that right? Yes, yes. Death of the flesh, yeah. 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 So when we start talking about walking in the spirit here, we're talking love, joy, peace, peace, guys, gentles. We're not talking about tongues. We're not talking about how to speak in tongues as we're walking all the time. We're talking about love, joy, peace, peace, kindness, the fruits of the spirit. Yeah. Okay. So. I just wanted to bring us up to speed to really talk about, one, finding the promises, knowing what the Word says happened to us, because this is God's way. This is God's umbrella. This is God's plan. This is God's Word. And what we have done by faith, we've entered into His faith and said, okay, since He's the planner of all of this, we just have to join Him in His work. So really, there is no work for us to do. Now, I'm talking about salvation. I'm not talking about leading people to Christ. I'm not talking about standing in the gap for people. I mean, that, of course, that's work. But when it comes to pleasing God, there's a simpleness of just by faith believing. Okay. Because we're talking about justification. So let's go into verse 5 then. And since we're talking about walking in the spirit or in the flesh, we'll keep that in mind. As we go into verse 5. Who's got it? <clears throat> yeah, I've got it. Um, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Okay. Hmm. So anytime we see the word sinful nature, we always want to circle that and write down the word flesh just so it doesn't mix us up in our theology, so to speak. Because when we say sinful nature, we think of something completely different than the flesh, these members that mm -hmm. sin resides in. Because sin's not in you, of who you are, it's in your, in your flesh. Okay. So we're talking about their minds or having our minds set on spirit or the flesh. So, I guess uh, I have a notes here that I put in here, and I have two columns. And I'll just read them out to you real quick. If you're taking notes, great. If not, you'll just kind of listen to them. But I have two columns, one after the flesh, one after the spirit. 
And uh, I'll just say with you, column one, number one is we mind the things of the spirit. Mm -hmm. So we're done about spiritual things. Mind the things of the spirit. Two, spiritual minded is life and peace. Spiritual mind is life and peace. Three, it's not in flesh, but in spirit. These are things that God's telling us through Paul, not in flesh, in spirit. For if spirit dwells, for if the spirit dwells, five, Christ is in you. Five, Christ is in the sixth, spirit is alive. So what we're going to learn and see in chapter eight is that one, mind the things of the spirit. Our mind is on the things of the spirit. Two, spiritual minded is life and peace. Three, not in the flesh, but we're in the spirit, being guided by him. Four, if the spirit dwells in us, it's a question mark for a lot of people. Five, Christ is in you. And then six, spirit is alive. So we see how the Holy Spirit is working as Paul is laying it out here in chapter 8. And he has a contrast of the flesh. Mm -hmm. And they are one. Mind the things of the flesh. So the mind is on the things of the flesh. That's right. And two, we're talking carnal or fleshly. We're going about carnal minded here a little bit, or fleshly. Three, carnal minded. And carnal minded is enmity, hostile against God. So carnal mind is, is hostile against God. And four, it's not subject to the law. Colonel mind is not subject to law. Five, Colonel mind can, is flesh. It cannot please God. Or flesh cannot please God. Six, have not the spirit of Christ. And then seven, is not his. Capital H. Is not his. Does not belong to God. So we see all the things that are in the flesh. They mind the things of the flesh, too. They're carnal and fleshly. Three, they're carnal minded. Enmity against God, not subject to long. Four, five, flesh cannot please God. Six, have not the spirit of Christ. And seven, is not his. Capital H does not belong to God. Well, pretty much what Paul is saying here in verse five is that those who are in the flesh mind the objects after the flesh. Mm -hmm. So the really the intent, the activities, the purpose, and the will of a person is after the flesh. So a spiritual mind seeks spiritual. Yes. So they're evident and they're clear. You can see them clearly what they are. You can look at a person in the flesh and you can be a fruit inspector and you can tell them what they're at, where they're at. And those who are in the spirit, they're minding those things in the spirit. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're not here to judge people because God is the one that judges. So I never judge people, but I do take a critique of things. So I can critique, and if I see somebody and they're saying to me, man, mm -hmm. I got so drunk last night and I found this blonde, I shacked up with her all night. Let me tell you, man, I got the worst headache today. You know, I said, well, that's interesting. Okay. Well, my mind pretty much told me exactly where that person's at. Yeah. They got drunk, they shacked up with somebody, fornicated, and they had a headache. So it's really easy for me to find out that this person's going to need Jesus. So my mind automatically now gets into gear, and I'm always thinking, now, what illustration, what can I say, what is... Or how is the Holy Spirit going to guide me to tell this person about Jesus? Uh, make sense? Mm -hmm. So I'm always actively waiting for the Holy Spirit to speak to my mind and help guide me wherever we're going. You know, so the neat thing about being led by the Spirit is He's led by the Spirit in us and He'll guide us. Okay? You know, little joke here. I was reading through uh, Coach, and I he's got a, a friend there, a cop, who posts a lot. If you guys know who he is, 
Chad. Is it? Who? Who? Chad. Chad. Yeah. Okay. So you guys know yeah, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> but he was, they had some pictures on there of him being a cop on his first bust. He he got like 15 pounds of marijuana his first bust. Yeah, I saw that. <clears throat> I typed in the bottom of that. Boy, I used to smoke that in two days. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I used to, I used to go that, that's a small amount of a pot, man. I smoked it in two days. But anyway, as a little joke, so I used to, as a joke, if somebody came and said, I've been drunk, I'm smoking, I'd say, oh, yeah, I used to do that for, you know, that's a little joke. But anyway, okay. <laughs> Verse six, who got it? For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay. So we're falling under those two categories here. Carnally minded, a fleshly minded, mm -hmm. right? Or pretty much who, who is a carnally minded, which, John, you talked about is death. It, it's a person who's unregenerated. It's a person who's not born again. They're still separated from God. They don't have the life of God yet. So we should be really in mourning over those people who don't know Christ yet. And I know, I know you guys went to the abortion clinic, but, uh, you know, we went to a gay parade. There's a gay parade when I had coach here in Oregon. And I didn't know there was one even happen. It just popped up in the paper. And so they all went down there. Now, personally, I will go to a gay parade because, one, I don't like to see three foot dildos hanging on guys. Uh, the Bible says that they are reprobate. They don't have the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they're not going to be convicted. They're so hard hearted. And it grieves me. When I go to those places, it just makes me so mad. It grieves me. But I do feel sorry for people because they don't know Christ yet. So I'll always find a way or words to help bring spiritual concepts to carnal minded people. And because I know the Holy Spirit is always pricking the mind or the heart of a person who's currently minded, I know that when I say things, my words are going to be doing this to their heart. Yes, yes. And so either they're going to listen or they're going to start flipping me off and getting mad. So I know that when I start to bring the gospel, two things are going to happen. They're going to listen with an intent or they're going to start I'm pricking their heart, they're going to get mad at me and start cussing me up. So I've always prepared myself for those two. And I don't take it personally. You know, if they want to reject me, I just go, okay, you're carnal minded, but hopefully next week those seeds I planted will start to bloom a little bit. Or next month they'll bloom a little bit. That makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Because I've read verse six. I know carnal minded is death. Yes. So they're going to have eternal death. They're already going to die. They're already going to go to hell. Mm. Mm, that's right. So I'm going to do everything in my power I can. And if I've got to bring the gospel and prick them, hopefully that prick will be a, a seed at the bottom of that and it'll put a seed down there and it'll start to germinate somehow. And hopefully somebody will come and water that. And I don't care how it gets harvested, but one's got a plant, one's got a water, one's got a harvest. Man. So I know that whatever's taking place, God's going to bring somebody like you guys to do the next level. Mm -hmm. Or you'll do the first level and I'll come in water. Or you, mm -hmm. However it may work. So, but the spiritual mind is life and peace. So life and peace is what we have from, from God. It's one of those promises. Mm -hmm. So let's look at John 17, 3. The Gospel of John 17, 3. And then 1 John 1, 3. So John 17, 3. Who's ever got that one? <clears throat> I can get that one. And then 1 John 1, 3. I'll get that one. First John okay. 1, 3, okay. and John 17, 3. Um, and this is eternal life, 
that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Okay, so written in red, we know that Jesus said that eternal life is knowing God. So <coughs> one of the ways to witness <coughs> is to help people find God. So, so what are the ways that we help people find God? Mm. Ish. Right? Okay. First John 1 3. Mm. Yes. First John 1 3. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, mm. so that you may so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Okay. So we get a pretty good picture knowing God in Jesus Christ. And we, we study how justification takes place, sanctification, imputation. We've taken all that now into our hearts. We understand how all that works. Now we get a couple of that, that as we know God and we're spiritually minded, we're following God. It's up to us now to reveal God to people. Okay. Mm. If, if that makes sense. Yes. So really, yeah. knowing God is evangelistic. Yes. Because we're the light of the world, and wherever we go, we're going to either be the smell, the Bible says, of life to people, or we're going to be the smell of death to them because they're perishing. So if we get around people, and we're the light, and we're, we know Jesus— and they're living in darkness, they know in their heart, and they're being condemned and convicted already. So if you ever wonder why people go crazy when you're around them and you talk talk about God, because they know something's not right. And they're they're screaming inside. Yes. They, they don't know. That's right. And chances are there's somebody's booty. Somebody took a booty and they ran from that. And they, now they don't want anything. Mm -hmm. I told you guys a story. When I was a young man, uh, I got invited to a Baptist church. And when I went there, the person they told me, you know, you got long hair. You need to cut that hair off your ears if you want to please God. You know, it was in the early 70s. Long hair was coming in, Beatles, hippies, you know, love going your way. And I was one of those type of guys that had hair touching my ears. And I was at a Baptist church. Then I went to church with my sister. She just got saved at Nazarene church. And I wore jeans and a t-shirt to church. Didn't know, didn't, didn't know better. To a Nazarene church. And they told me uh, I shouldn't be dressing that way. That I need to wear nicer clothes when I came to church to please God. So I told my sister, I said, hell with this. Man, if I got to wear more, better clothes, look differently than who I really am. I'm not, I'm not coming. This is too weird for me. So I never went back. So four years later, I didn't go back. So four years later, till a girl invited me to go to church. Mm -hmm. And of course I went. <laughs> She's good looking. Okay? Yeah. And she told me to wear my jeans. So I thought, well, I can wear my jeans. She's good looking. Uh, yeah, I might get lucky tonight. <laughs> That's all I care about. I'm still in the flesh back then. Yeah. Sat in church, heard the gospel. I'll be born again. I went, wow, what's this? I'm raised Catholic, man. I know I'm, I'm Catholic. You know, I can fornicate and still go to heaven. And then someone told me what fornication was. And I went, wait, that's called fornication doing that? And right then, I got convicted. I knew right then and there, because someone explained me the word fornication. And, and they said it was a sin. I went, oh, no. I mean, I can't have sex anymore. I can't mess around. And right then, it was like conviction. It had to, it just there it was. So the spiritual mind that we have invades the carnal mind. Okay. Now, mm. verse eight seven. Watch this now. Eight seven. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Oh. So the carnal mind is against God. 
So God is the object to be against. So they're not against us, though they sort of are. But really, they're against God. Because the carnal mind's enmity against God is not subject to, nor indeed can be. So God is that object that they're against. Now we might we gotta say to ourselves, why? Did somebody take them booty, give them false teaching, show them some weird stuff? Did they watch Kenneth Copeland on TV? You know, I mean, what took place? You know? I don't know. Daryl and I were talking about this, and Daryl was talking about Oral Roberts and Oral Roberts was really good for years, then he kind of went like this a little bit. So um, you know. Maybe they're listening to the Benny Hens or something, and they never made a million dollars because they sent a bunch of money to Benny Hen, and now they're still poor. I, I don't know. So my point is people minds get screwed up, and they become somebody's booty by false teaching. So if yeah. we just sat down and explained the simplicity of these scriptures of people, nine times out of ten, they'll submit to God. It's that simple. And I've led so many people to Christ by just saying, would you would you mind taking an hour out and just listen to me read the Bible to you? Some of these things just blew my mind first time I read them. And they go, well, I guess I could do that. And I, I'm not going to preach to you. I just want you to read this. It's like reading a novel. It just blew my mind. So I'll grab people and I'll just read to them certain scriptures that I like. And they go, oh, I never heard that before. I said, yeah, a lot of Christians never heard this either. And they go, what does that mean? So I get explained to them, they go, wow. And then I go, well, time's over, man. We're done. Oh, can we go longer? No, no. Why don't you come back another day? <coughs> so I leave them hungry. Mm -hmm. So they want to come back. Okay. Yep. So we find out God is the object here. So that brings a whole new picture. So now look at verse 8. It's a continuation of 7. So then. That is controlled. Oh, wait, 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 wait. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Okay. So, continuation. In the flesh, they can't please God. We know it. It's, it's clear. He said it. So, our evangelistic uh, mind should be kicking in about now. Okay. Verse 9. You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Okay. He made a statement, you are not in the flesh, but you are in the Spirit. Because our mind is on the Spirit. And he, he clarified it by saying, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, does not belong to him, right? He is not yeah. his, capital H. Mm. Pretty simple. Yeah. So how do we how do we belong to Christ? Well, let's look at a couple backup verses like Ephesians 2.22. Somebody grab Ephesians 2.22 and somebody grab 1 Corinthians 3.16. So who's got 2.22 of Ephesians? And who's got 1 Corinthians 3.16? Yeah, I got Corinthians. Okay. You want Corinthians or what? Sure. Yep. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? Don't you know? Don't you know? <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> yeah. Sounds Don't like you know? a Canadian. Don't you know? <laughs> Don't you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ephesians 2.22. And you also are joined with him and with each other by the Spirit and are part of this dwelling place of God. Okay. So we're connected. We have the Spirit. Yeah. We, we know it. Right? We know it. Yes. So if we know it, then we got to say our, to ourselves, okay, since I'm living in the Spirit, then I'm going to mind those things in the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, faith, kind of gentleness. 
and it's evident what the flesh is. So as a person is growing in their maturity, they're going to be able to be walking in the in the spirit, and then one time they'll flub it and they'll go, "You dirty rotten son of a," and they'll cuss and go, "Oh, uh, profanity! I live by the flesh," <laughs> and they'll know it, <laughs> and they'll say, "Sorry, God, for doing that." Repent. Mm-hmm. They'll keep the step of the spirit. Trump. See, it's evident. And I, I guarantee you guys, you guys love the Lord. You're walking with the Lord. And he's guiding you every minute of the day. And when you stub your toe against a sin rock, you know it. And all you have to do is say, oh, the Holy Spirit showed it to me that it was wrong. Because he, mm-hmm. capital H, lives in you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we're talking about being spirit led here in chapter seven. I mean, chapter eight. Mm. So you need to have confidence, confidence, assurance. One, knowing, don't you know that the spirit lives in you, that you're saved, you have eternal life and you are well pleasing to him. You need to know that. And if you don't know that, then you're going to be living under condemnation. You won't live by verse one. Right mm-hmm. now, I live by verse one, and I know there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So I walk now in this understanding that He said it about me. Yes, I don't say it about myself because I'm a worm, man. Put me in some dirt and I'll swim around it. But He said that to me as His promise. So I put myself under the umbrella of what He said about me. By faith, I'm going to believe it and hold him accountable to his word. Amen. And that's Amen. where Christians miss it. They don't have faith to believe that God really is doing it in them. That's right. Mm. So I'm not, I don't get into condemnation. When people say things to me, I just go, that's your problem, not mine. You know? I was at a restaurant a couple of years ago. And I was out having a beer with a buddy of mine. With a, we had a couple of big steaks and a couple of beers. And this guy used to go to my church came up. He's probably from Tampa. Man, you should be having a beer, man. That's sin, you know. And I said, "Wow, you you you're that lukewarm still, where a beer makes you stumble." Like, what? I said, "Well, if an alcoholic drink makes you stumble." then you're really going to struggle with what Jesus did at his first miracle at a wedding. Because mm. he made some wine, which is the best wine, and he saved it until last. Now, I know theologians say it wasn't alcoholic and that kind, you know. I mean, what is wine? It's alcoholic. Wine is wine. It's alcoholic. <laughs> and they used to take a little bit of wine, mix it with water to purify the water. Mm. They didn't take non-alcoholic water, grape juice, and put it in water and think that was going to sanitize it. I mean, it's just, there's just natural things in the, in the in the in your mind how they did things in the old in the Old Testament and New Testament. Okay. Now, uh, verse nine, not his. Look at verse ten. Who's got it? Verse ten, eight, ten. And if if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Whoa. Oh, yeah. This is a hard one, huh? So, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. Wait a second, I'm still alive. Well, what he's really saying here is that we're living in dying bodies. Body's dead. It's, it's going to die. So the price has been paid. We're in dying bodies. And the the change from the Adam body into the Christ body has not yet happened. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead. It's dying because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So the spirit is life because he's producing righteousness in us. We are declared righteous, right? 
we were not made 100% righteous. He declared us righteous, but yep. right. we're being conformed into his image daily. And we are not only declared righteous, but we're becoming righteous as we're being conformed daily into the mm. image of Christ. Oh, Just like chapter 5 and 6 talk about when you go through trials and tribulation, it conforms us into Christ. Mm. Don't mm. think it a strange thing when you go through these. And we discussed that very well last time. Right. So when I go through hard times, I don't think it's strange. I think where in me is that producing the image of Christ? Yes. 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 Something's happening in me. And I'm yielding to things. My mind is now concentrating on spirit. I, my mind is after that. So I know that I'm being transformed and something's taking place. I can't tell you because I don't know. Because the Bible says that sometimes I don't even know how to pray, but the Spirit makes intercession for me with groans and utterings. Oh, I don't want really to get there yet, but we'll, we'll get there. I think we talked about that a little bit already. Okay? Mm. So, what what he's saying here in verse 10 is that life-bearing forces are in view. The resurrection of us is in view. Mm. If you have the Spirit, you are alive. So, he, what he's saying is that you have these these life forces now that are in you, and you got to view it. You got to see it. Yeah. What that, what that means is the resurrection. It's right. Amen. Amen. Resurrection of Christ. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the spirit is life. Because it's wrong. Okay. So, if you know that you're dying, you're dead. We know what chapter 6 said about you, you're dead, don't use your members. You crucified with Christ, identifying with him in, in, in resurrection water baptism. You already know what happened to you because you identify with that. And you know that your body's dying in verse 10. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. He's giving you life. The resurrection is in view here. Here's that promise. Mm. That's a yeah, promise. Yeah. Mm. So I, I don't worry about anything anymore because he made a promise that life is in me. I have resurrected life in me. Yes. Yeah, that's right. I'm going to be it. resurrected. Mm. There's no condemnation. I don't worry about a single thing. There's nothing in life I worry about. Now, sometimes there's fiery darts and arrows that come in my mind, and I start to fear at times. Oh, oh geez. You're going to pay the bills? You got a flat tire? I do something wrong. My wife says something to me, and I go, oh, gee. You know? But so those things happen, but I have to take my computer mind here and analyze scriptures real quick and do this and go, blah, 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 and go, wait a second. What am I fearing? What am I worrying about? So I've got to get my mind back on the spirit. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, it's good. Amen. There's a lot of times, man. I, I mean, there's, I go through little times a lot. I go, oh, uh, and I have to stop and steady myself and memorize the word. Bring mm -hmm. back the promise. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, verse 11. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, who, who's got, oh, sorry. I missed that bit. Got verse 11 hey and if spirit, the spirit go go willie sorry mate but if the spirit of him who raised jesus from the dead dwells in you he who raised christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you amen yeah. oh wow hey. mm -hmm. hey. That's cool. now we got a, we got a duality going on here yeah right? yes so we're living in dying bodies that are going to be resurrected. But if Jesus dwells in us, he's going to quicken a dying body. So something that's taking place that he is energizing our dying body and bringing life to a fallen piece of crap. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, that's you hear what I'm Yeah, I like that. Okay. So... He's going to quicken our, our dying bodies. He's going to bring life to it. So this is my divine healing verse. Yes. I tell people all the time that 
if you're a Christian, a pastor, will you pray for me? And I always go through, well, have you, you sinned? You've been doing this? Because I don't want to pray for somebody who's stealing from their neighbor. I don't want to pray for somebody who's doing, you know, I want to analyze first, find out why they're going through problems. Because mm -hmm. if all they have to do is repent, then they get the blessings of God. Yeah. God. yeah. Right? See. But if they fell down and broke their arm, then I'm going to pray for that person. They broke their arm. I'm going to pray that God will supernaturally heal those bones, those ligaments, um, you know, and there'll be a quickening of the mortal body. If that makes sense. Yep. Mm. Right? So that's no, my divine no, healing verse. Didn't, no, it didn't make sense to me. Oh, say that again? Sorry, Tim, it didn't make sense to me. Is that making sense yet? No, no. Okay. I, I, I just struggled with the first bit about how you wouldn't pray for somebody because they're, you're basically saying they're not in a righteous condition, but surely the people that are sick spiritually are the ones that need the prayer most. True, but a a false prayer, if, if I'm with somebody, right, and I just use uh, committing adultery, because I, I did work with a bunch of guys who have committed adultery, but specifically, this comes to my mind, it's a good illustration, guy in my church was committing adultery. Solid guy, beautiful wife, four kids, uh, had everything financially he ever wanted. Uh, I mean, just, he, he, he was one of the guys that had most everything. But he's out shacking around. And didn't he come to church? You know? So when he was having marriage problems, he came in for counseling. We were talking about it. And he said, you know, Pastor, just pray for me that, uh, you know, I can, you know, I, I said, no, I'm not going to pray for you. Why should I pray for you? Because you know what you need to do. Let me tell you what the scriptures tell you to do. You never pull your pants down in front of a strange woman. You say no. And, and I said, so we need to talk about self-discipline here and that you have your mind set on the things of the flesh. So we had to stop and I had to teach him what the Bible said about having his mind set on the things of the flesh. If I would have just prayed for him and said, oh, I'm going to pray for you now God will fix everything. Just head and go on out. That prayer would have been empty. There would yeah. have been no teaching, and the Holy Spirit yeah, would not yeah. have something to work with. Yeah. So I had to bring him to repentance first. So I brought him to repentance by saying, you know, you're following your carnal zipper, buddy. You know? And I, I had to use the illustration. There's two heads on a man. When one gets hard, the other one never thinks. You know, and he went, and I know Tim, but I said, there's no buts. You're following the flesh. Then after about an hour of talking and we're going through scriptures, explain to him chapter eight. I sat down and said, you don't understand chapter eight, do you? Whatever happened to you? And he goes, ah, no, I never really understood chapter eight. Well, after that, he understood chapter eight. So he had to make a decision what he's going to do. Well, he made a decision, but by that time, his wife made her decision. Hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, honey. You know? Mm -hmm. So, his life changed and went in a whole different direction after that. So, my, my point is, if we, have to, if we don't have a solid understanding <laughs> of how to minister, mm -hmm. then we're going to falsely lead somebody astray. Hmm. And that's why I say I'm not going to be anybody's booty, any man's booty by false teaching. So I will allow the Spirit of God to guide us just like you guys are. So Martin, you you hear from God. God may say to you at the time, I'm going to pray for him. And then you he might ask questions, and then you might have to teach him by saying, well, now we have to go this direction. So I'm not saying I'll never pray for him, but what I'm saying is I'm going to nail him first with the word and teach him before I'm going to pray for him and just send him off. Because a lot of our prayers happen at a church circle. People come up for prayer at the, at the front. We pray for him real quick, and we expect a miracle. And I never saw that in Scripture. I saw Paul sitting down with people, spending hours with them, teaching them the word, even to the point to where a kid fell off the second balcony and fell down dead. <laughs> and then Paul went, oh, bummer. And I got to go raise that guy from the dead. <laughs> right? We had to go there and raise the guy from the dead. 
you know, had to interrupt his teaching. Then what did he do? Raised from the dead. He went back and started teaching again. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand um, where you're coming from, Tim. I, I guess sometimes um, there's opportunity to pray for uh, people, and sometimes you can actually um, teach within the prayer. Yes, so yes. You're targeting, you're targeting your prayer in a way that actually convicts of the sin because you're talking about exactly what his problem is to the sovereign God. Do you know what I, you know where I'm coming from? Yeah, exactly. I know exactly. Yes, and that's true okay. too. That's true too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we're both on the same plane. Yeah. We're both saying room it's the same thing. I'm just attacking it at a different view. Yeah, yeah. And, and and yeah, I get that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we're living in dying bodies, but the spirit dwells in us. Who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through the spirit who dwells in you. So there's life <coughs> coming to our mortal bodies as we're dying. Yes. Yeah. So there's that promise there. So God can give us abundant life in our bodies as we're growing old and dying. Make sense? Yeah. Yes. So. Yes. Was that Tony? Tony, you're muted. I just, I was just saying, you said, does it make sense? And I was like, no, but yes. I mean, it takes a bit of getting your head around that, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that yeah. doesn't, it, yeah. Anyway, it's all right. Carry on. I've got it. No, no. See, it's these type of things where our faith comes into view. And mm. that's where the Holy Spirit has got to bring this truth and stretch our minds a little bit. So when we talk about having to wrap our mind around it, we have to really look at that and study it and go in a second. So the Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in me, and he's going to bring life to my dying body. He's going to give me abundant life. So my divine healing verse is this. God, I want to pray that I don't get the COVID-19. I'm going to pray that I don't get the flu. I, I'm, I'm going to pray that I don't, when I'm walking, I don't trip and break my ankle. Mm. I mean, you know. So, yeah. uh, and then I, when I do get sick, because I, I don't have a spleen. I lost my spleen in football. So, uh, when I was younger, when I got a cold, it would go to pneumonia. Well, I've had this bad case of pneumonia, and I get my, my lungs now have a bit of a problem. Yeah. So I've always asked God to quicken my mortal body. And then I was flipping houses years ago, and I got into a house that had some kind of an acid chemical. We broke a bottle, and, it, and the fumes went up. I ended up breathing it, and I got poisoned to where my <laughs> hands went numb and my feet went numb. I couldn't feel things. So I go to doctors, and they didn't know what it was. And 48 hours later, they couldn't do any testing, and, and whatever it was went through my system, and I peed it out, whatever it was. My, it was in my tissues. I couldn't find it. And I had numbness ever since then. And doctors couldn't figure it out. Well, I still got this numbness, but I said to God, okay, God, quicken my mortal body. So now, by faith, God has given back to me what got destroyed. And then that makes sense. So the numbness that was really bad is only half the numbness that I had. So he's quickened my mortal body. He's brought mm -hmm. life and regenerated part of my body. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's my divine healing verse. So you guys, as you go forward, you can say to God, okay, God, these are some of my shortcomings or my sicknesses, you know, and you can pray that's God to heal those. Mm -hmm. those. You know, I got I got a friend that's got bad arthritis, and he's always asking God to quicken his mortal body so he can move his hands. You know, now I don't have that problem, but he does, and so he's asking God all the time, and he does say to heal, get warm, he'll. 
do this. You ask God to bring blood to his hands, and he sees supernatural things take place in his body. And he goes, you know, Tim, I never would have thought about trying that, to do this without reading that verse. Because he wrapped his mind around it, and he said, okay, Holy Spirit, you can quicken my body and make my arthritic hands start working better now. So he doesn't have 100%, but it's better. Does that make sense? Yes. So I, I can't tell you how it works. I just know it's a promise. And if you believe it and you start asking God, he can quicken your mortal body. Brings vitality. Right? And this is what I call preventative care. It's a, it's a spiritual leading. You know, and then he'll give his wisdom about how to have a good diet, exercise, holy living. You know, I, I only eat so much fast food in a month. I don't eat out fast food very often because French fries and and that kind of food puts it on the belly and it's not good for an yep. older man to eat that kind of stuff. Sure. Right? Yep. So as an older man, I watch my diet. It's, just, it's natural wisdom. Okay. So this same quickening, the Father raised Jesus up, the same quickening, the divine power resides in us. And it'll quicken or, or vitalize, make alive, and give life. Mm -hmm. Give life is going to resurrect you. It's going to quicken your mortal body. It does all these supernatural things in us. It's a promise. So, Tony, when you're praying, you just put your hands on your wife's arm, and you just claim this verse. God will quicken yes. that broken arm. Mm, yes. And that any nerves, any nerve damage, anything, and just have her say, you know, I believe, and I'm going to stand on 811. Mm. And if your wife, Tony, stands on 811 and just says, you know, I believe by faith that God can quicken my lower body and bring these things back together. Sit back in faith and watch God start to do his thing. Amen. Yeah. Yep. Yes. 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 Yep. This is this is really complex. This this verse, isn't it? Really, because the mortal body is that which is going to die. Yeah. And and but but we need the mortal body to to actually live in this world mm -hmm. because yeah. we have to relate to it by our mortal bodies. Yeah. So we have to be led by the spirit of God. This is this is very complex. It is. Yeah. Yeah. So. Let me make it more complex. Uh oh. No. <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> so, people who live under the lie of Satan, that they cannot live a life of victory, that they can't crucify the flesh. So, the lie is that Christ did not finish his work. So, Christ really did finish his work. Didn't he say it is finished? Yes. Yes. Uh, and, and the resurrection was the proof that God accepted the payment for sin and raised him from the dead. That was the proof, the resurrection, that God accepted the sacrifice. Wow. And this is a biggie for a Christian. Because if you really believe that Christ finished his work and he gave you this, you can rest in this. You know, I believe that Christ finished his work. There's nothing else I have to do. So when I read these books, I just saw a guy on TV today say, I just got this revelation from God. It was on YouTube. I just happened to see it because I'm watching this Trump stuff and on YouTube. Right next to it, God spoke to me. God gave me this new revelation. Mm. And it's in my book. But I'll tell you, this is what it is, you know. And for 1995, if you buy my book, I'll tell you the rest of it. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? If it's true, it's not new. And if it's new, it's not true. <laughs> I don't need another man to tell me about 8 verse 11. That's right. Because yeah. it, it's, it's finished. And this is his promise, so I'm going to walk on that. Right? He said it's finished. Well, that's a huge verse out of chapter 8. That's also part of sanctification or the righteousness that God's putting in us. So if you really believe that he, he will give life to your mortal body, why not go lay hands on somebody and raise them from the dead? Why not go pray for a sick person 
and see if God will heal them. The first time I ever saw healing by my hands was a young girl who broke her neck. Piper board. Those, those boards, piper boards like this, you throw them on two inches of water in the ocean, and you run and jump on them and you skim. Yes. As you're, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. She threw it in the water. She went and jumped on it. She jumped around. She went like this. She flew back on her neck, came down on the back of her neck, snapped it, was laying in the water, knocked out. We, we pulled her out of the water. She was all white, blue lips. She was out. And I was freaking out because I was a youth pastor at the time. Didn't know what to do. I had 25, 30 kids on the beach. I'm thinking, yeah, here's a girl who's going to die under my watch. And I'm thinking, what that just happened? We got her out, got her in and started praying for her. And I I just said, I just prayed for her, laid hands on her. And I said, now, God, as I'm laying hands on her, I ask you to quicken her mortal body. Because your spirit dwells in her, Father God. Quicken her now. And I was screaming. I was worried. I was in fear. I was, I was, I mean, I was freaking, guys. And all of a sudden, her eyeballs were rolled back in, in her head. And you can see it white. You can see, you can see your pupils. And all of a sudden, she goes and coughed because <coughs> water was in her lungs a little bit. <coughs> you know, and first thing she said is, and we're on the Oregon coast, which is about 50 degrees, freezing water. And she goes, uh, wow, why is it so warm? Mm -hmm. Why is it so warm? And we're all going, what? So we made her lay there for a couple minutes and, and uh, you know, because we're all praying and people ran down the beaches looking for doctors or paramedics. A nurse came jogging down and so we need to have her sit here, put something behind her neck, you know, it's all this dirt. And we did that for a little bit. Finally, she goes, guys, I'm okay, watch. <laughs> and we went, oh, okay. But then maybe she just got hurt. So, rest of the story. We get home. I tell her mom what happened. I said, you need to take to, to a doctor, have her checked out. She goes to a doctor. They take x-rays of her neck, comes back, and the doctor says, so how long ago uh, did she break her neck and, and well, she was healed? Well, my daughter's never had a broken neck. No, the crack is right here. See the x-ray? It's right here. The crack is right here in the x-ray. And it's completely uh, filled in now. And what are her, is she numb? Is she I mean, paralyzed for a while? I'm going, no, sir. She's never had a broken neck. So that was the first time ever uh, I prayed for somebody and I saw him healed. Mm -hmm. And it freaked me out. It just freaked me out. And that was the first time I realized that if he, the Holy Spirit, lives in me and is quickening me, why can't I do what the apostles did and what the disciples did in the New Testament? So I hear people say, if God's really alive, how come we don't see more of this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's because people don't understand 811. If the average Christian really believed verse 811, they would have no problem going out and praying for, for more people. Sure. Right? Because it's not about me. It's about he, the spirit, who does the work through our mortal bodies. So by faith, we just go and pray for somebody. The same thing Martin just said. Why don't we pray for people more? So mm -hmm. like Martin said, they can be convicted through prayer. They can be do things. So we should be praying for them so they can be healed through prayer. So Martin, I'm just taking it one step further because I'm hitchhiking on what you said. That they can have conviction. They can have healing. Uh -huh. See? Okay. I don't, I don't want to camp on this too long, but I wanted to really hit this because when we talk about the spirit dwelling in us, there's no condemnation, and we have our mind after the, after the spirit, not after the flesh, then we're keeping in, in step with God the whole time. And if he says, you know, look what's happening over there, we should be the first ones to head over there and deal with a situation, whatever it is. So if you have no condemnation, and you've got confidence that God dwells in you, you'll be more bold to go do it. Right? Yes. 
I mean, Tony believes that abortion is wrong. So he's out there on the streets with his pictures, believing it, and he's doing something about it. Right? So now we just believe also in something else, and we we do our pictures in a different way, whatever God calls us to do. Yes. Okay. And again, Satan, if Satan can, can get you to believe it, he didn't finish it. He didn't finish his work, and there's still mm -hmm. things that have to happen. Exactly. We'll get into works. We won't rest in it. It's finished. Yeah. It, it's finished. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Enough of that. I just hope I got my point across. And we we kind of steered down that river a little bit. Okay. Verse uh, 12. All right. Here we go. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. Okay. Verse 12. Therefore. Anytime you see a therefore, you have to go back in, in light of what he just said yes. and say, and then go, uh, in light of the spirit that dwells within me, giving me life, in light of all that, therefore, in light of that, brethren, we are not debtors to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We owe the flesh nothing. We're not in debt to it anymore. The debt was paid by Jesus Christ on the cross. And you identified in the death and resurrection when you got saved. You got born again. There's no debt. No debt. He just told you. There's no debt. You owe it nothing. Mm. And we think we owe things to people or we owe things to God or we owe things to the flesh. or You owe, you owe nothing to the flesh. There's no rule over you. Reckon it dead. Don't use your memory. It's done. No debt. Okay. Um, You're not linked to it. You're not linked to it any longer. So if you don't yield your members, you're not linked to it and you owe it nothing. So when my mm. flesh, my flesh sometimes rears its head and says, you need to go do this, Tim. You know, and I, I, I don't owe you a damn thing, flesh. Yeah. You know, if a, a guy, I was talking to a guy a couple weeks ago and he said to me, Tim, how did you overcome lust? This young man, he's in his late 20s. His, his engine is still strong. It's still going, you know. And I, he said, well, how do you overcome that? And I said, well, I learned to say no. And he goes, what? I said, I learned a Bible lesson. The Bible says I'm dead. And if I don't yield my members, I won't sin. So anytime sin presents itself, I just say, I'm dead to that. Mm -hmm. No. And that the Holy Spirit energizes my flesh to overcome any temptation. So by saying, no, I'm dead to that, I'm dead to it. Now the Holy Spirit energizes me to overcome all temptation. Make sense? Now, I'm going to say it again. There still are times when I'll stub my toe. You know, I'll be going down the fast lane. Somebody's in the slow lane. Neek, neek. You know, get over. My wife says, will you be patient? You know, and I forget patience is part of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, right. peace, patience, kindness. And I go, oh. Lord, you know, because I like fast cars. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. <laughs> so, we see, uh, we all the flesh that, okay, verse 13. Mm. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you will put death, you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Okay. Pretty much when he talks about dead, it means to mortify it. Keep under control. It's dead to us. So we now live empowered by the Holy Spirit. So if you mortify it, you reckon it dead, Holy Spirit has something to work with. He can resurrect a dead body. He can bring life mm -hmm. to your flesh. You can be empowered. So either the Holy Spirit's in control of you or you're in control of you. So I'm dead to that, man. I, I tell myself every morning, well, Tim, you're waking up dead today. I'm waking up dead today. And then I say, okay, Holy Spirit, you have your full reign in my life today. 
Yeah. Even if I'm sitting home watching TV, I'm, I work out of my house. So I'm kind of semi-retired because my business now allows me to do that. So I, sometimes I just sit home and I go, okay, guy, what am I doing today? And I'm being guided even when I'm sitting in a chair watching an old Western movie. <laughs> Good old John Wayne, man, let me tell you. <clears throat> okay. So after the flash, you will die. This is a fact. He just said it. So the activity of putting off is up to the believer. You can't be passive in it. So the Holy Spirit is going to help us in our walk. So let me say this. We're, we're not endowed with a reservoir or a deep well of his power. You put off daily. He, the Holy Spirit, guides you. Instead of being like in a lake, think of it, you're in a river. Because if you're in a lake, you just sit there and float around. But if you're in the river, God's going to guide you. You're going to be in the water. And there's, there's movement all the time. So you don't have a reservoir to draw from, but you have He, the Holy Spirit. So victory comes as we take positive movement to mortify the flesh, to reckon the flesh dead. So it's up to the believer to walk in the truth of what happened to him. So if the Bible's telling you how to do it right here, then it's up to the believer to walk in it. <clears throat> that makes sense? Yes. So I hear it all the time. But Pastor Tim, I just don't feel like I am. I don't feel. I said, you don't go by feelings. You go by faith. Hey, what does yeah, the Bible right. say to do? But I don't feel. I, you don't have a reservoir of strength. You know, I've heard people say, you know, if you just go deep and grunt out from deep, you know. I say, well, that's good for some people who are self-disciplined. But the people who are not self-disciplined better know the word so well that they can say, I'm dead to that. Mm. Mortify the flesh. You know, I, I don't have a big reservoir in me. Uh, I get bored real easy. Things happen in my life. I, I'm kind of an A-type personality. I'm kind of hyper. So I got to be active. I got to be doing things. So I can't dig deep. I just don't have it in me. I'm not that kind of personality. So I sit back and I go, okay, God, I'm just going to walk with you today and you have to guide me. Because I'm of little faith. That's who I am. I, I don't have this big reservoir of faith. I just trust the Holy Spirit will guide me at that moment when I ask him to or when I'm walking. Okay? Verse 14. If you have any questions, guys, keep on jumping in there like Martin does. Ask questions because we got to get through this. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Yes, man. Same connection to verse 13. Led by the Spirit. You put off the deeds of the dead. You're being led by the Spirit. And what are you? A child. That's how you know you're a child. You're a son, daughter of God, because you're being led by the Spirit. You're part of the family. You're an heir. So if you're not led by the Spirit, yeah. You're not you're not a son of God, dude. That's right. You're not his. You're not capital H. Mm. Oh, because he says yeah, because he says in the next piece of scripture, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we, we know we're governed by the spirit, verse 14. Fruit of the spirit is the evidence. Right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So he's sanctifying you. You're no longer doing these deeds, but you're now walking in the spirit. Okay. Verse uh, 15. For you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. Boy, mm. that is a huge verse, guys. And mm. we quote it so flippantly. But we really understand it. 
It's confirmation of sonship by the Holy Spirit. It's a guarantee of eternal life. There's no spirit of bondage anymore or fear or dread. No more dread, but there's liberation of being in the spirit, eternal life. We are adopted. And what happens? We cry out to God. Right? Yes. Yes. We receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Father. Father, Father, we cry it out. Father, he's my father, my heavenly father. Mm, okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay, uh, let's look at Galatians 4, 6 real quick. Galatians 4, 6. Galatians 4 6. Who's got it? And because we are his sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. So now we can rightly speak of God as our dear father. Yeah. Yeah. So mm. how do you how do you know that you're sons? Because he sent a spirit. Yes. Yeah. yes. And how do you know he sent a spirit? Because you just read chapter 8 of Romans. You know exactly what took place. That's right. And you have a you have all the facts in chapter eight of what happened. No condemnation. You got the spirit. Be led by the spirit. I mean, you can go through these and, and just start adding up all the facts. So next time you ever read one of the epistles and it says your son, you can go back to chapter eight and say, well, how do I know my son? Well, chapter six, I identify with the son. Born again, I'm resurrected. I don't yield my members. There's no law in chapter seven, and there's no condemnation. In chapter eight. Mm. But I can write the whole thing off from. You know, I go through trials, tribulations, and five. I know why, because I'm a son. It conforms to the image of Christ. I, I identify myself, chapter six. I will yield my members in 612. Chapter seven, there's no law to me. I died to the law. I'm married to another. No law for me anymore. I'm married to Christ. The Holy Spirit guides me. Chapter eight, no, no condemnation. Mm. If I, my spirit cries out, Abba Father, he's my father, and there's no condemnation. So I put wow. all those together. Five, six, seven, eight, and I see that the whole time. So because I I have read it, I know it from chapter five to eight, the doctrines, and I put those together and never stray from that understanding of all those chapters put together. Because those are the teachings that Paul laid out. They call them, they call them the word doctrine. These are the doctrines of the, but doctrine just means teaching. Different denominations have different teachings. That's why the doctrine of the church is this. The Episcopal doctrine is this. Baptist doctrine is this. Pentecostal doctrine is this. This is a teaching. Okay. So we know we have sonship. Okay, verse 16. Yeah. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Mm -hmm. So we got yeah. holy union here. <laughs> We're united with the Spirit. That's a holy union. If you think about it, we are his children. Join ears with Christ. Okay. Look at verse 17. We are God's children. We will get the blessings God has for His people. He will give us all that He has given Christ. But we must suffer like Christ suffered, then we will be able to share His glory. Mm. There you go. <laughs> okay. Notice again the word heir. Children, join heirs, union with with Him. And He says, "What happens? Know that." Not only will you suffer with like Christ suffered, it's a known fact, you'll also be glorified together. So don't count it, you know, a strange thing when you go through trials and tribulations, the Bible already taught us, because it's conforming us to Christ, but we will be glorified. Mm. Okay. Right? So God is our inheritance, guys. 
you are going to inherit God. Ish. Like, just Ish. like you would in, inherit a million dollars, God is now yours. Mm -hmm. You are his. You are his mm -hmm. booty. Mm -hmm. Let him carry you off. You're guided by him. It's because we're kings and priests. Mm. Yep. Yep. Mm. So glorify Same. together. What, John? Levites, yeah. yeah. Glorify. So glorification and resurrection is on the other side. So we're stuck in this body as being conformed by not you, but glorification is coming. That's that's our promise. It's coming. You're going to be glorified, guys. You're going to be brighter than the stars in the sky. Okay. Verse, any questions? Verse 18. Thinking then. Verse 18. Where you go, Johnny or someone? Come on. Yeah, right there. Uh, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Well, okay. He draws a parallel here. Mm. Suffering cannot compare to the glory. <clears throat> really, that's going to be engulfed and transformed into. So here's our sufferings we go through, and it's like small, but the glory and the transformation is going to be so much bigger, it's going to engulf all of that. So it's what I call the BB in the box car <laughs> That's about how much wisdom I got in my brain. I got this little BB to throw into a boxcar, train in a boxcar. I a little BB rattles all around that big giant boxcar. You know? And that's about what's going to happen to us. We're gonna, that little suffering we have is going to be engulfed by that giant boxcar. We won't even see it anymore. Mm. Terrible, terrible illustration. Okay? But it's oh. one of the facts. So pretty much, if you don't let this enter into your mind, how the transformation is going to take place, uh, it will just kind of float over it and it won't penetrate the heart to where a person has joy. It's knowing that suffering is just part of life. You live in a fallen body. Welcome to it. Mm. Okay? But there's no comparison. You can't compare it. Okay? Okay, verse 19. Um, for the earnest expectation wait, wait. of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. Oh, wait. Hey. Mm. So the whole creation, we're talking about angels, the mm -hmm. earth, they can't wait for this revival to reveal. They can't wait until we are revealed. Mm -hmm. So how mm. can the earth even grow? When the angels are looking into God's grace on us and they're understanding God's patience and long suffering to sinners, so they're going, Boy, God, you're patient, you're love. Boy, you, you know, so the angels are learning about God and looking at us. So even the angels are marveling at God's grace and God's love to us. But the earth now, the whole creation, is waiting in expectation, eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. So the earth can't even wait to be liberated. The earth is under a curse. And we don't even think that. Wait a second. The earth is under a curse. Thorns and thistles. It once brought all this fruit, all this great stuff. And it can't wait to be revealed and see the sons of God because it's going to see its fullness again. Yes, yes. Restoration. Wait, wait a second. That means all the sons of God are going to come down to the earth again. What's the new earth going to look like? Ooh. Mm. Wow. You know, I mean, one city, the, the city of Jerusalem alone is four square, thousand miles wide, thousand mm -hmm. miles long, thousand miles high. One city, the Jerusalem. What are the other cities going to look like? Well, I mean, what's, the, what's the other parts of the earth? How big is it going to be when it's transformed? No mind has seen, no, no eye, no, no eye see, no mind, you know, become mm -hmm. a God is prepared for those who love him. That's right. Mm -hmm. 
So what's this glory that's waiting for the sons of God? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. But the Bible gives us some sparkling insight a little bit. And just that one little bit of speckles that he gives us blows my mind. Ish, ish. You know? I don't know. I don't know. So, but Satan and the demons, they're not going to be partakers. Mm -hmm. Amen. Satan's dreading mm -hmm. that day. And at the last days, he's going to pour out every little lie he's got. So, right. I, I'm preparing myself. You know, I got a friend that's in the, he's a 20-year Navy guy, retired, and he told me that, hey, he said, you know, Tim, Trump's going to lose. All hell's going to break loose. And he goes, I see the communists coming in, and it's over. It's civil war, it's this or that, you know. And, and I said to him, you know what? I don't think so. But if it does, Satan's going to pour out everything he's got. He's going to be lying, deceptive, and I'm going to be ready for it. Yeah, you know? I mean. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. That happens. Because I'm going to stand up, preach the gospel. I'm going to be bold. I'm going to carry my nine millimeter, my Glock, wherever I go. If I need it, if I don't need it. But I I look forward to seeing how strong will I be as those guys come after me. It's like, Tony, you're walking down the street with your signs, the abortion pictures. How strong were you in the midst of those people? Oh, mate, yeah, we was bold as lions and getting bolder, man. Tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Oof. Yeah. See? And just by you knowing that and doing that, you're being energized by the spirit. Mm, you were. You know? Yeah. And you're being transformed from glory to glory. I mean, I'm sure something happened to you after you left that, that <laughs> in your heart and your soul, you're never going to be the same. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. That's right. There's a few of us in here that exactly, exactly that. We yeah. talk about it. Yeah. Mm. There's a new twinkle sure, in your eye. Yeah, you know, I when I get around pastors, man, I, if anybody has ever pastored or led a group of people, uh, and they've been beat up on, they've tasted a glory and a persecution that should put a twinkle in their eye, to make them have more backbone than they've ever had before. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I tell every pastor, I say, man, get into the Word, believe chapter eight, and uh, walk in it, man. Because most pastors I know get beat up so much, they, they lose it. And they, ah, okay, I don't see enough fruit, so I think I'm going to stop. And I tell them, even if you have 10 people, are they discipled yet? You know, I mean, I, I spent two years with a group of people just discipling me. And somebody said to me, well, why did you spend so long? Can't you just read the Bible to them? I said, no, that's not what the Apostle Paul did. He spent two, four years at places trying to teach them. You know, it's not a, it's not a fast, easy thing because you have to teach it. And let it get into them. You have to teach it again. Let them see it, and then teach it again, so they can walk in it. Yeah, yeah. They see it. Oh, okay. Then they claim it. Okay. Then they walk in it. It becomes them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm with you on that. You, you know what I'm saying? Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Practical. Okay. Let's go on uh, first. Uh, what are we? Eighteen. Okay. Uh, tw tw Twenty. Oh, 20. 20. Yeah. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the, into the glorious freedom of the children of God. Okay. So yeah. the creation was subjected because of him, capital H, God, which we know in Genesis 3.17, when that took place, okay. somebody should read, Gen so we know for, that it's a fact. Genesis 3.17, someone needs to read that to us real quick. So the creation became subjected because of him, capital H. God made the earth. The earth is waiting in hope still. The earth is in mm. anticipation of the glory of the sons of God. Go yeah. ahead. Who's got it? 
because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Okay. Poor earth, because of our sin, mm -hmm. sin upon mm -hmm. me, or whatever, we corrupted the whole earth. Yeah. Now it's paying the price. Wow, look at that. Yeah. You know, when I, when I told my son, I said, when he was old enough to understand stuff, I looked at my son one day and I said, you know, Timmy, I said, you're under a curse. And I'm sorry that I had you as a son because uh, now you're going to have to toil and trouble the, rest, trouble the rest of your life as my son because you're born a human. But I want you to know that I love you so much and you'll never understand how much I love you. Uh, but welcome to life. And I can't wait to share eternity with you. And my son now is of the same faith I am. He's 30 some years old. And he's gone through his hardship. He, he went through a divorce, which tore his heart out. He went through a woman who's not faithful, who was a Christian girl, met at a Bible college. One day she woke up, wanted to go. Uh -uh. And he could never understand how that happened. And for about three years, he didn't want to date. He just said, Dad, I don't trust. I just don't, you know. And I never, I've never been through a divorce. I married the same woman, you know, for almost 40 years now, 39 years. But I've never felt that pain. I was raised in a divorce home. But I saw him go through a gut-wrenching divorce. And I said to him, son, you're looking more like Jesus every day. And he said, yeah, thanks, Dad. I said, no, you are. I've, I've seen a maturity in you and strength in you that uh, I, I don't see another man. And yeah, that's true. Okay, here's a word of encouragement. You will witness the cosmic regeneration to come. The cosmic new earth, new heavens, yep. cosmic regeneration. Mm. You are going to see that. What is that going to look like? <laughs> When the yeah, earth is back to its fruition and the universe is populated again. Mm -hmm. You know, when I look, I, I, those the guys, I was going to throw this by you. I, I believe that there was a rebellion in heaven, a war took place up there, and I believe planets were destroyed, and I believe they became dust. Mm -hmm. But I think there's population and life, even on other planets years ago, and there was something in the cosmics where the sons of God sang gloriful when it was, when it was produced. Something glorious, that cosmic realm was just full of life and air and water and green and whatever, purple and pink. And I think something took place that caused that whole cosmic realm to fall and we're on the earth. And now this is what's taking place. But when the earth gets to be restored, that whole cosmic thing is going to come back, whatever that may be. Mm. I believe that. You know, I believe there's going to be something fantastic, and we're going to see it. And I think we just take the gospel so lightly. We just think, oh, I'm a little wormy sinner that God's been trying to work in me. And we have a small little mentality. But if we really read the scriptures and we see how huge it is and how what glorification really is ours, uh, the inheritance of God to us, and the glorification of our bodies, that there's no condemnation for those who walk not after the blessed, but after the spirit. You see that, that is you. That's your promise. Mm. Yes. And if you die before Christ comes back, you're going to be up there with all the glorified saints waiting for that to take place. And when that takes place, everybody's jaw is going to drop. We're all going to go, oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Ah. Okay, so these are some heavy verses. Okay. On blowing. No, what time we got it? We got plenty. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah. Okay. So the creation was subjected to it. Verse 21, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Okay. So we're going to see that. 
Oh, well, let's look at Acts 321 real quick. Acts 321. Acts 321. Oh, turn this. Who's got that one? He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. Ooh, so there you go. Okay. I had that in my note, just as backup scripture. All right. That's good. Oh, yeah. See, it, the Bible tells us stuff, but unless we, Romans is so clear. It tells us everything, and then we get glimpses of what Paul taught the other churches. So you got to remember, when he wrote the epistles, they all had questions, and he's answering the questions took place. He just because he taught them face to face, they knew this. He said, "Don't you remember these things?" You know. So he's re refreshing. But in Romans, we have the whole story because he had never gone to Rome to preach and disciple people yet. Mm. That's why we have Romans. So praise God, he never he got shipwrecked, he got beat up, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so I think I thank God that Paul never made it to Rome, you know, because we got it. Okay, verse twenty-two, eight twenty-two. For we know that All that right. whole oh, creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Same thing a woman goes through. He said it, birth pains. Look at a woman. She goes through these nine months, and then one day she gets delivered. She's in agony and pain. Okay, verse 23. Told you how it works. He got Lando. Go on, doing good. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the spirits, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption the redemption of our body. Yes, yes, yes. So not only the creation, but we also guys are going, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> uh, we're growing. Uh, mm -hmm. We're growing. Uh, I can't wait. Uh. You ever do that? Yeah. You ever, guys ever just got to oh, go, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got to go get it. Yeah, got to yeah. go to work again. Uh. Mm. This afternoon. <laughs> 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 Yeah, so we're we're stuck with the, with the earth, whole creation, right? Yeah, verse fourteen, seven four seven twenty four. Oh wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? That's all groaning. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Mm. Hey guys, just um in my um in my um new living, it says um this is halfway through that twenty three verse. It mm -hmm. says uh. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will um, give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. Um, that's interesting, that, yeah. that he'll give us full rights, as though we don't have full rights um, as adopted children now. Is that what that's saying? Only because we're trapped in this fallen body. Sorry, mm -hmm. what was that, Tim? It's only because we're trapped in this fallen body. Yeah. If you oh, were yeah. liberated out of this body, you had to be a resurrected body. You have, you have full rights. You have you'd have the promise. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. 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 But until that liberation out of our body happens, we're still stuck in it. Yeah, because it says here in mind that, that we have the first fruits of the spirit. So mm -hmm. if we have the first fruits, there must be more. There must be second and thirds and fourth, wouldn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't be greedy, Tony. Don't be greedy. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it's like it's like one guy said, it's a down payment to guarantee you. The Holy Spirit was your down payment for mm -hmm. eternal life. So you you get to drive the car because you put the down payment. You get you get to have it, right? But not fully have it. It's not full years yet anyway so we're waiting to hope okay verse 24 
For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hoped for what he already has? Verse 12. No, so city. what he's pretty much saying is that we're hoping for that day. We, we have by faith, we're resting in it. Mm. And our hope is going to carry us through. Yeah, it's ahead of us, eh? Yeah, we're still waiting for it. We, we know it's coming. We just have to patiently wait. Mm. So, if you're like me, I'm very impatient. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so we're waiting. Very, 25. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. There you go, Tim. <laughs> So we're just waiting until until the reveal happens. When yeah. that reveal happens, that transformation, but we have to wait. Okay, right? 26. So in that same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes with us with groans that mm -hmm. words cannot express. Oh, <laughs> Okay, so this is one of those fun verses because the Spirit knows our weakness. Sometimes we don't yeah. know how to pray, but the Spirit takes our groans, our uh, 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 and translates those into prayers to the Father. Because we don't know how to pray with groans which cannot be uttered. So there are times when you're going, then there's times you're just going. Mm. You ever watch somebody pray when they're doing this? Yeah. <laughs> just waiting and thinking? Mm. Yeah. You know? It's the Holy Spirit praying inside them. I always thought that was tongues he's talking about there. No. Huh? Yeah. See? No. There you go. Pentecostal teaching, certain doctrines. Nope. Yeah. No, nope. he, the Holy Spirit, is taking those groans that cannot be uttered. That's we knew that he takes our groans earlier. Then he takes the groans that cannot be uttered. <laughs> <laughs> that changes it, eh? Yeah. You guys know who Dan Bongino is? No. No. He's a guy on YouTube, Trump guy. He's an ex-Secret Service. He was a Secret Service guy for the president for years. And he does this talk one hour. And he talks about whatever's happening. And when he talks, he'll go, huh? Hmm? Because he'll, he'll want to cuss. He'll, I feel like doing the double barrel. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll... <laughs> This is a family show. <laughs> yeah. And his wife does the <coughs> computer. <coughs> She's sitting in front of him. That's my wife right there. She'll knock me out. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm not going to go deep, but there's a whole range of weaknesses. Everybody's got a weakness. I'm not going to talk about it, but whatever your weakness is, he, the Holy Spirit, knows what it is. So you may think you have a unique weakness. He knows it. <laughs> he does intercession for you. He lives in you. There's no condemnation. Don't worry about your weakness. Right? Let him have it. Let him work through you. Okay? Wow, what a yeah, Lord be. Yeah. And let me say this. He's the Trinity. He's the Godhead. He's part of the Godhead. And when we talked about Jesus being raised from the dead, we already spent some time talking that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all got together and worked <coughs> on the resurrection. Yeah. So he knows you. The Godhead knows you. The Godhead, God, resides in you. He knows you. Mm -hmm. He knows your heart. 
He covers you. He makes intercession for you. He loves you. Mm. He loves you that mm. much. Even the angels, the Bible tells us, are longing to look into these things like, why does God love them so much? Yeah. See, guys, mm -hmm. we, and you know what we say to ourselves? We think we're worms. We think we're not worthy, which we're not. But instead of walking by faith, what he's done for us, we live in a worm mentality. That's right. Yes, That's sir. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, so and I'm just telling you that because I do it all the time. I'm just telling you, I have, to, I have to assure myself that there's no condemnation. I have to walk in what the Bible tells me I am. So that's why that's why I reckon um, you know we go down to Wellington on the weekend and there's you know all of New Zealand and there's there's you know a thousand people there you know, and you yes. say where's the church? Well, I'll tell you where the church is. That just where you just said. No, they, don't, they don't know their true identity in Christ, and so they've got yeah. all these problems and all these hassles and all these worries and all these guilts and condemnations and so they 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 don't feel they feel hypocritical to come and fight the battle yep yes <laughs> yeah so martin that means you tony and john and martin you're all going to go out and start a church and start preaching and teaching people now <laughs> so when this is yeah. over when the study's over you guys a couple of you guys need to figure out how to put studies on and Take people through the eight chapters of Romans and, and get another 20, 30 people grounded in the faith. Yeah. Really do. Because yeah. you need to have another Bible study and make sure you, all your friends, know justification, imputation. Mm. Right? you mm. got to teach them. Right? right Amen. Now? Okay. He's working on somebody now. So, yeah. Okay, <clears throat> we're... Verse uh, 20, 27. Oh, wait a second. If we're in still 26, uh, you can have two verses right down. Hebrews 7, 25. And 1 John 2, 1. So we got one minute. Let's, let's, let's look those up real quick. I don't know if we're going to finish tonight or not. We'll try, but we might go over. Hebrews 7, 25 and 1 John 2, 1. 725. First John. Just about 725. Yeah, first John 2 1. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Amen. Uh, completely. Completely. Because he's making intercession. Wow. Here you have it. There's First your John 2 1. Okay. Uh, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Who's yes. your advocate? Jesus Christ. Mm. Thank goodness for that. You're covered by the Holy Spirit. You're covered by Jesus Christ himself. Mm. Wow. Man. <laughs> covered by his blood, too. I mean, let that stick in. I mean, so who can be <laughs> against us? No weapon for him. Right. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's not even Satan. Can, can't even bring an accusation. The Bible says, resist him and he will. Flee. 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 Gone. Yeah. I, I don't rebuke. I don't buy because I know there's most false teachings. I just resist them. Or if I really go, if I ever feel like it's really him, 99.9%, .9%, it's never Satan. It's just life. You know? But the 1%, when I did deal with satanic stuff and, and the devil stuff, I told you guys the story about that. People come to my house, Christians, cutting themselves, putting blood all over. You know? Um, you know, threatening my kids to kill my kids. Um, those were real threats and those were times when I just said devil you know where you're going you know where you're going devil and all I did said God you, you said you protect my family the Holy Spirit lives in my little kitties 
because they were like in fourth, third, fourth grade at that time. And they never rejected Christ. So they, they were following Christ because it's what they were taught. And it says, okay, God, you will protect them. So I, that's all I did. I said, God, I trust you. And we never had a problem after that. Okay. Let's go on. Um, 27. Sorry. sorry. Um, Tim. Yep. Um, yeah, I get, I get that. All right. But, but what about the guy that the Christian guy that's kneeling down and just about to have his head chopped off? Right, he's going to be beheaded, you know, and his family will be praying for him and he'll be praying for himself. And you, you know what I mean? So, yep. so, so, yeah, sometimes you get that sort of deliverance that, 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 that you talk about there. But, but guess what? Some, sometimes you don't. Try. Right. And you, you know, you know why a person is going to cry, and why a person is going to worry, because they don't know the promises. They don't know that they live in dying bodies, that is being generated and strengthened by the Holy Spirit, and death awaits us all. Huh. And they don't understand the glory that's on the other side. Mm. So if a person is really taught about the glory that awaits them, and they know death is going to come to all of us, and the Bible talks about those saints that are killed that way have a better resurrection. Don't ask me what that is. All I know is that God rewards those who go through certain things. Mm, that's right. That is so, a martyr, that. Yeah, the martyrs, man. There's some, you know, when you're martyred for Christ, and most, most of us think we're being martyred because somebody goes all <laughs> to us. Oh, God. Oh, the rejection about kill me. <laughs> <clears throat> you know? Yeah. Oh, Mr. Jones doesn't like me. Oh, my God. I might. Oh, my God. Oh, you know? Mr. Jones, stay hype. You're going to hell, buddy, unless you find out who God really is. But <laughs> I think. I think there's an area where once we understand the glory of God, the revelation, uh, we really understand imputation, justification. He is in us. I think once we really see the whole picture of this, having our head chopped off is going to be cool. Because it can only happen for a quick second. Huh. And it's like Peter, don't crucify me straight up, crucify me upside down. I will not be crucified like my Lord. So they crucified Peter upside down. You know? So they went after the Apostle John. They boiled him in oil, and he didn't die. So they put him on Patmos. He lived, he lived the rest of his life as a boiled egg. <laughs> you know? So when I, when I think about martyrs, I mean, if you guys ever read the Fox's Book of Martyrs, I mean, everybody, everybody had to buy that book. Everybody needs to go buy the book, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Go get a used copy from a bookstore. Just buy a $2 copy from a bookstore and read it. Fox's. Did you say Fox's? Fox. F-O-X? F-O-X-E-S. Book of Martyrs, man. I'm telling you, everybody should read that. And uh, it, it'll change your life. It will change your life. Um, so I guess, Martin, I think there's just that, that comfort knowing that God lives in us yeah. and that my family, I've talked about my death so often, they just tell me to shut up. Shut up, Dad. You know? And uh, if Biden comes into the United States and it goes crazy, I'll be witnessing. And if they tell me to take the shot, that new shot that's supposed to be coming out, I won't take it. You know, uh, I really, I really get the the COVID nineteen and go through it, and then I'll be immune. But yeah. that shot, I just don't no. trust. It. Yeah, I think there's yeah. something hanky panky going on. Mm -hmm. to no, that's, what I, that's what I think. But you know, who knows? That's just my weird thinking. But I, I guess Martin, what I'm saying is, if it happens, I'm going to glorify myself in that, and if not. Uh, I'll leave everything to my kids. Yeah. yeah and let me tell you something, Martin, too. 
the Bible says that he gives us three score and 10 years of life, 70 years. So his promise is pretty much 70 years, and that's the average lifespan of a person. If they live hard, usually, you know, 60s, whatever, you know. Uh, genealogy plays in that too. Certainly, I, I, I believe some people live to be 90 because they're sinners and God's given them life to repent. Yep. That's what I believe. I, I believe if you see someone who's a sinner and they're 85, 90 years old, God gave them extra years to repent. And I told my family, I'm 63. And I said, I got seven years left, less than seven years. And it could happen anytime. To me. I've got four or five of my friends are dead already in their 60s. You know, my best friend was a chaplain. He died at 58. Heart attack. So I, I'm watching friends of mine fall dead. And I told my family, I said, you know what? I saved up for you guys and my inheritance I did not spend. Because the Bible talks about a wise man saves for his children's children. So I've uh, put together my real estate for my children and my children's children. So uh, I don't, I, no seven years, guys, you won't see me unless God does something special. And if he does, I'll be praising him with my breath. And if I go, don't cry for me. Just, uh, I'll be on the other side. Sure. I'll be surfing those waves. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Remember, remember that song, uh, Don't Cry for Me, Argentina? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't cry for me, Argentina. That movie. <laughs> yeah. So, just trying to decide for you guys. Okay. We're going over. We might have to go one more week, but we got to get through a couple of verses. Can we do a couple more verses real quick? Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. Where are we? 26 uh, and 7. Let's read 26 and 27 together. Who, who's got that? Anyone? Well, I have. I have. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. Uh, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit itself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with God's will. So we see the whole Trinity at work here, searching our heart, knows the mind of the Spirit, and knows us. We're covered, guys. We are covered. Left, right, up and down, east and west, north and south. And he knows. He searches the hearts. He knows our heart, guys. So let me tell you something. You may think you have some rottenness in you. You do. You may think you don't measure up. You don't. Sure. You may think you have warts and all kinds of problems and pimples and whatever. You do. But his love covers all that. His love knows you're a fallen human being. And mm. he searches your heart. And he makes intercession for you. Huh. Can you be covered any other way? Knowing that you're a fallen, scarred human being, but God lives in you and he's making intercession for you daily and it doesn't bother him? Because he loves you? Amen. Yeah, that's right. He knows you in and out. You know, and I, I think we try to hide from God. I think we try to hide our weaknesses. Some I, I don't know why. I, you know, I tell my wife all the time, God loves me. He knows. He goes, yeah, but I don't, honey. My wife gets ticked off, but, my, but God doesn't. I'm, I'm thankful God's not my wife. Because I screw up all the time. She has rights. <laughs> I do that. Because you know, I'm not the best <laughs> husband. You know, I make a lot of mistakes with my wife. But mm. nine years later, she's still there. I don't know why. But... Okay. So, he searches our hearts. He knows your deep thoughts. Even your groanings, all in human body, right? God's mind is also in you, right? And you don't have to worry what to say because he makes intercessions for you. There are going to be times when you know what to say, and there's going to be times you don't know what to say. Try. 
And that's okay. He's covered you. He just said it right there. Yeah. You're going to know when to pray in English or tongues. And other times you won't know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit in you, you'll be going either this or you'll be doing. And you're still praying. Yes. You guys yes. are covered. You know? There's times I, there's times, let me, I lay in bed. A lot of times I don't pray. I just lay in bed thinking. Because I read this verse, I know that as I'm falling asleep, just thinking about life, the Holy Spirit is doing something in me as I'm falling asleep. Mm. He's searching my mind. He's searching my heart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. Because I did my best to walk in the Spirit all day. There's no condemnation who walked not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So I could fall asleep at night time knowing I didn't murder. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't steal from anybody. So... I must have walked in the spirit all day. I must have walked in all of that. Mm -hmm. I lay in bed and that time going, you know, God, you strengthened me and equip me by your word to show me that I'm keeping in step with you. And the Bible says, be in step with the Holy Spirit. So I have confidence mm -hmm. now every night when I go to bed that I'm keeping in step with him. And if I don't, my wife will tell me. Because I got a good wife. My God gave us a good wife. Right, guys? Right on. Uh, yeah. 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 Mm. Okay. Mm. What well, else? We, we, we ought to be so alive, eh? When you when we read this, our Christian lives ought to be just wired, eh? I mean, heck, the living God searching our hearts. And this is a crazy good. Knowing our minds. We're going to close this last verse 28. You, you, you can't close that till you read this. Yeah, right. Who's got that? Come on. For, we, know, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the call according to his purpose. What, what are the first three words of 28? For <laughs> we know. What? For and we know, sorry. And, and we, we know. know. Do things. we really? No. <laughs> yeah. No, we haven't. We haven't. No. Yeah. See, wow. all of these times Paul says, well, don't you know? Or therefore, mm -hmm. and we know. I mean, I, I, I tell you guys, for 20 years, I said to myself, well, I never knew that. I don't really know that one. Yeah. Then as I started studying, reading this, and, and concentrating on these, I'm going, wait a second. This is one of the promises here I'm talking about. Wait, 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 wait. And we know that all things, wait, some things, all things work together for good mm. to those who love God. I love God. Am I called? Yes. According to H, his capital H his purpose. purpose. His purpose. And what's his purpose? To be born again in Christ. Mm. What? Chapter 6. To identify yourself in his death and resurrection. Mm. To allow the Holy Spirit to come and live in you. That's his purpose. So since I know his purpose, I yield to him, saying, Holy Spirit, come and live in me. I yield myself to you. I will not yield my members to the flesh. I yield them only to the Spirit that will guide me. And there's no condemnation. So I live in no condemnation, guys. I do my best. I mean, there's times I, I have condemnation because either I sin or my mind plays tricks with me. And I have to go back and read this to assure myself. Yeah. So I read this over and over, these scriptures, uh, to reassure myself. Now, mm -hmm. after 30 years of teaching this, uh, I've read it so many times that I'm confident that God's word is true. Yeah, it's good. You know, it's good. I'm confident that this is true. I believe yeah. that, what we just read. You know, and, yeah, knowing all things. Yeah, and you can't take it, you can't, you can't take this from me. You can't say, but Tim, what about this? And you read a book to me and try to convince me. You won't convince me. You can't read a scripture, take it out of context and try to, Hoodwink it. Right. 
<laughs> right? Amen. Yeah. And I read what Paul wrote to Timothy as a young man. I mean, he was like 17 years old when he started pastoring. 17, he was like 21 when Paul wrote the epistle. He was 21. Don't follow these guys, Timothy. Watch out for these men. They have nothing to do with them. And I'm trying to think, how many 21-year-old men can stand up to another old man and say, I want nothing to do with you? Yeah. Pretty tough. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I said that to somebody and uh, ended up going to the U.S. Supreme Court for it. Mm-hmm. Trust me, everything I had. Lived in a trailer with my wife. Trust me, $250,000 in uh, lawyer fees. But you know what? Not only was it strengthening in my heart, but I won the first defamation case ever in the church. And the good thing about it is they had to pay the they they had to pay me for my pain and suffering and other crap, and I had to pay my attorney for that. But uh, I made enough money to pay for all my attorneys and to pay for my lost wages and stuff. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Martin, when you say to me about fear, let me tell you, I, I was fearful at that time. And I had friends say to me, Tim, don't go to court against the church. And I said, they're not the church. That's a corporation. That's right. Every yeah. denomination, they're a corporation. That's right. The church is the ecclesia, the living body. Amen. That's right. Mm. Amen. And yep. when I confronted these two pastors, I called 10 other leaders, other pastors, and said, you guys need to come in because these people aren't listening. And the Bible says, bring two or three people to come in and talk. And Paul laid out in Scripture, says, isn't there anybody mature among you that can come and help do this? Why do you go to court against your brother? Are you that immature? So at that point... I went through a time when I confronted and then things were said that were that were defamation. And I said, if you don't take that back, I'm going to do what Paul did. I'm going to appeal to Caesar. And people said, what, what does that mean? I said, well, go read the Bible and you'll figure it out. And so I did. And I appealed to Caesar. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, when they did their briefs and found out and recorded everything found out that they uh got caught lying and they called it impeached testimony their testimony was impeached and uh there you have it the jury saw that away mm-hmm. and uh so I, I guess guys what i'm saying is that life is full of bumps and hills a lot of things we go through that other people may say you should do that because the Bible says this, but if you read the Bible, you're going to know what you're supposed to do and the Holy Spirit will guide you. And when I, when I sat down with my wife and I said to her, this guy said this, this guy said this, this guy said this, this guy said this. So I had all these things. And I even had people say to me, uh, you're a wicked man. If you go through a court, and I thought, okay, I'm a wicked man. Yes, that's true. I am. I agree with that. And But I said, Holy Spirit, you're guiding me to go this direction. Oh, yeah. So I'm just telling you, during that period of time, all these bumps that I've been through in life, God has always been there. This has been good, Tim. It's been really, really good. In fact, um, like I always say, there's just, so much to chew over, you know. I just have to go over and get over and over. I've listened to them some of the early teachings over again. I think, man, how much I miss so much. Even you know, out of from one teaching to the next, like you said, it takes a while to sink in. So, and I'm we're a bit slow down here in the southern hemisphere, you know. <laughs> um, but but we're getting it. We're getting it, and I love it, man. I love it. It's 